I'm going to talk about uh, Chem Locator, and Chem Locator uh, is a tool that we have uh, that can help search uh, for chemistry in patents, and not just patents, but actually in documents in general. But uh, this particular study uh, that I'll be talking about uh, was done by my colleague uh, Dora Barna in conjunction with the Chem Locator team, and the PO of the Chem Locator team is uh, uh, Joseph David, and uh, so his team uh, contributed significantly to this too. So, um, you, know, you know, the basic problem is that as with all of scientific literature, uh, patents are increasing every year. Um, there are more and more of them, and it's harder to keep up uh, with what's going on. And even uh, he here is the, uh, the, the the, the 2015 numbers, and that was at a quarter million, or excuse me, at 2.5 million. And by the following year, it was already over 3 million patents. And so, so there's just more and more uh, data to analyze each year. And, and, and much of this comes out in, you know, in various documents and in journals, and you know, nobody can really read it all. So there needs to be some way uh, to, to get this unstructured information and turn it into something that you can do something with. So, uh, as I noted, um, you, you know, there, there's lots of new documents, and eventually uh, the various indexing services will get around to extracting the structures, uh, to linking those structures and reactions uh, to the citations. But just having uh, uh, a structure linked back to a citation or a reaction may not be sufficient for the purposes you need. And plus there's a delay between the time that the indexing services will get that information to you. And you know, there may be a cost to that delay uh, depending on when you decide to go uh, um, uh, use the search service to see what the latest results are. And so what scientists really need is a better way to extract, aggregate, and analyze data out of patents and out of the literature in general. And that's basically um, a way to turn that unstructured data into structured information. And uh, our solution for that is ChemLocator. So ChemLocator is able to take uh, data from a vast uh, uh, array of sources in a lot of different locations. You can get uh, files in many different formats. You can uh, extract information from PDFs, um, from PowerPoints, um, from SD files. You can extract names, uh, cast numbers, and they don't have to be located just on your local drive or even in a network file. You can get that information out of a, a Google Drive or out of OneDrive or out of Dropbox or, or many different sources. So ChemLocator is able to extract this information out. And the way it is able to do that is, is that it uses a combination of ChemAxon's naming technology to grab uh, chemical names and cast numbers and other known IDs and, um, and also um, uh, using uh, optical character recognition and optical structure recognition uh, such as Clyde or Osra and, uh, and marrying that with uh, free text indexing. We're using Elasticsearch for that and also semantic indexing. So we're using a Cybyte integration uh, to, to, to get uh, the semantic indexing there. And um, so we're able to pull out not just the structures, okay, not just the references, but also uh, you know, an array of metadata associated with that, the projects, uh, the targets that are associated with that, and put all that information into a database uh, that, that we can then uh, do further uh, queries on. So, uh, what I'm going to talk about now is an experiment uh, that the team undertook. And in that particular experiment, uh, they decided to look at all patent documents um, from 2015 through the beginning of this year. And that was about 24,000 uh, patents. Um, and uh, th they took all of those medicinal chemistry patents and uh, processed them uh, using ChemLocator. Uh, it did take a while. It took a, a, about a week to do that, and um, there was, it was a significant amount of data, data that came out of that. 
And then uh, once that was done, it was to start looking, well, what did we get out of that? Okay, there were 3.1 million different structures that came out of that, but there were a significant number of duplicates. And once the duplicates uh, w w were, w were, were filtered out, um, and once we removed some of the fragments, we ended up with about 740,000 unique structures. Um, it's interesting that, th that this is actually, um, it's interesting c to compare this number with an earlier study that they did. Uh, the team had previously done a study uh, of a lot more documents uh, um, looking at all of the open access documents in PubChem, which was significantly more documents. But in the end, they actually ended up with only about 200,000 structures. So it's a lot fewer structures. The patents here, in, in this case, actually had uh, significantly more structures. So uh, one of the things to do first is just to see, well, what do we have here? Uh, to see if, if this got the sort of results that we were expecting it to. And um, we can look a little bit at the chemical space of the structures that were extracted. Maybe. Okay. Um, and, um, you know, this isn't terribly surprising. We, um, we see sort of the expected fall off in molecular weight. Uh, the mode molecular weight was around 400. It is interesting that we have a little bit of a shoulder over here. Uh, this is probably because of, 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 of the fragments that were included in there uh, and, and also maybe some of the, the, the common uh, solvents that were also uh, showed up uh, multiple times. A little bit more information about the extracted structures. Uh, you can see the atom count parallels uh, the molecular weight, and uh, the, the typical structure uh, had maybe around four rings, but there's not really a trend there. It was just kind of all over the map. Uh, looking a little bit more at the structures that, that were extracted um, fr fr from all of these patents, uh, there was um, um, uh, some work done to, to look at how many compounds had another compound that was very close to it? In other words, were, were, these, were these patents that just had a single compound or were these mostly patents that had uh, a variety of related compounds? And about half of the compounds um, had a similar pair that, that was very close. Um, but um, there was also a significant number of patents that, that had things that were relatively far away in chemical space. Uh, it turns out that most of, of the ones that were uh, kind of far away from their nearest neighbors were, were, were kind of oddball uh, inorganics or, or things that were really quite unusual. And so um, not too many drug-like molecules uh, uh, came out of the ones that were truly unique. Uh, another way of looking at this is, is analyzing this data to see um, what the ring systems were, and um, there were about uh, 6,700 ring systems, and this is, uh, you can see the count. Uh, anybody want to guess what that is? Yeah, of course, right? So, so, so the first five um, were, were, um, were benzene, pyridine, uh, piperidine, uh, pyrimidine, and, um, and pyrazole, and uh, so, so those, th those appeared uh, quite frequently as expected. So this is validating the, the sort of analysis that we did. This is what we expected to see. It's kind of interesting to look at the, the ones that are way down here that, that only show up once, but these are some pretty exotic ring systems that are not going to be easily accessible. It has to be the same atoms, yeah, yeah. So. And um, so, so there was, um, there, there are a number of different ways to sort of slice and dice this. Um, because of time, I think I'm gonna sort of skip through a little bit of this. Um, a lot of patents had, uh, as you would expect, a, 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 a fairly small number, or excuse me, a lot of uh, structures were mentioned in a fairly small number of patents. A few were mentioned in a lot. Uh, but then if you look at which ones are mentioned in a lot of patents, it's uh, SDS and, um, and dextrin, which is just sort of a, f a filling agent. So, so that's not terribly interesting. Uh, if you look a little bit more, you can see um, 
how uh, the fragments and exact mo molecules uh, um, are, are arrayed in those different documents. And in general, the, the fragments appeared uh, about as tenth as often as the exact molecules. And so this analysis was not uh, overly biased uh, by the fragments. So um, once we have this data, you know, the question is what can we actually do with it? And since we had the semantic indexing, we had the capability of looking at the targets uh, using uh, using the extracted uh, t taxonomy information. And the Cybite taxonomy actually gives you a little graph that tells you how relevant something is for a particular target. So the longer that is, um, you, you know, the better. And, and this one says, well, it's not really very relevant for, for that one. And so you can filter out not only by whether or not the term appears um, within the patent, but how relevant that document is based on uh, a number of the other tags within that document. And so uh, we used uh, the semantic indexing uh, along with the extracted structures uh, to look at uh, the chemical space between uh, two different targets. And the targets that were selected um, were um, beta secretase and acetylcholinesterase. And um, what happened next is that all the structures were extracted from those two documents. And, and then the, the structures um, were compared to each other. And so on one axis, I have the acetylcholinesterase structures. And on the other, I have the, 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 the beta secretase structures. And we're comparing uh, he, here the, the, the dissimilarity or, or, or just the opposite of the similarity. So basically, most of the compounds were not very similar to each other. The darker spots are the ones that are most similar to each other. And if we take a little bit uh, zoom in a little bit on that region and look really hard. Uh, there's a few spots there where we have some exact matches uh, be, for compounds that appeared in, in both data sets. Um, and the results are not uh, terribly surprising, um, but, but they serve as a validation of the method. So uh, the pyrotoluene sulfonic acid is not interesting, but the other two are denepazole and galantamine. Okay, and these are both compounds that are used um, for um, potentially for treatment of Alzheimer's, and and both of these targets are are uh, you know considered potential Alzheimer's targets too, and so um, this sort of validates um, the method that we're able to look at two different targets, see what sort of compounds can we find that hit both of those targets that we might be interested in, and can we extract those out. Now, once you have a data pipeline like this set up, uh, one of the really nice features of ChemLocator is that you can, uh, you, you can uh, periodically pull, pull your data source uh, through the API, load in the new patents, uh, rerun that analysis, and, and do an incremental update. And so this is a way for you to say, for you to ask, you know, sort of continuously, are there new structures that, that have been patented that are hitting this particular target? Or are there new structures that are hitting both of these targets? Or are there um, similar structures to what I'm interested in, but hitting a new target that I don't know about? And so these are all sorts of things that you can do uh, with ChemLocator. And uh, it's a way to bring structure uh, to that vast amount of data that's out there. And with that, I thank you. Are you going to try cats for the same target? Um, meaning what? Meaning you can see if you can find some exact hits between two different patterns, supposedly. Oh, well, well, well. These are only exemplars, right? These, these are the exemplars. It's not Marcucci. Right? Yeah, we're not, we're, we're not going into the whole Marcucci enumerations, OK? okay. So, so they're only pulling out, pulling out exemplars, right? Because. Um, be, because the typical size of a Marcouche is, is in the billions, if not in the trillions. Yes? How, how do you decide a new pattern is that can relate? Um, well, there, there were a few things in there. It, it was uh, filtered on, first it had to have a structure that contained at least one carbon. And um, it, it, it had to have, um, um, it, it had to have some um, um, medchem terminology, you know, some known target information that was extracted from Cybite. I think Cybite 
um, you can, it basically has a list of targets, right? So it had to hit something on that list in order to be considered a MedChem target. 